Now, anyone who is involved in any type of clinical practice has to astutely observe the colour of their patient's skin and the mucous membranes. So by the mucous membranes, we mean the lips, the tongue, uh, the, the eyes, the conjunctiva of the eyes. The colour of the skin and the mucous membranes gives us lots of clinical information. So for example, we have a description of skin colour, which means that someone is a pale colour, a whitish colour if you've got white skin, and we call that pallor. So we can observe pallor in our patients. Now this could be caused by peripheral vasoconstriction just because the patient's cold. So when you're very cold, you'll have pallor. And the vasoconstriction, the peripheral vasoconstriction that causes the pallor is caused by sympathetic nervous activity. And this makes perfect sense because if we're going into a fight or flight situation, we want to vasoconstrict the capillary beds in the skin. And this does two things. Firstly, it means there's more blood left over for the heart and the lungs and the skeletal muscles, which are going to do the fighting or the flighting. That's good. And also, the superficial peripheral vasoconstriction means that if I'm injured or cut, I'm going to lose less blood than I otherwise would. So it's kind of anticipating the sort of injuries that might occur in a fight or a flight situation. So cold or sympathetic activity is going to cause pallor. And in our patients, we can notice it when they are anxious or when they are in pain or when they're angry. That can cause pallor because of the vasoconstriction. And also shocked patients can have vasoconstriction and pallor. So for example, if there was an obstructive shock or a cardiogenic shock or most commonly a hypovolemic shock, if someone was bleeding and their blood volumes were too low, if they were hypovolemic, then they would have pallor as well because there's a reflex peripheral vasoconstriction to try and maintain the blood pressure. It's a compensatory device because the peripheral vasoconstriction will increase blood pressure. So always look out for pallor. It can mean a lot of different things, but it's a significant clinical observation. Now, I suppose the converse of pallor is flushing. When people go a, a reddish colour as a result of peripheral vasodilation this time. And this could just mean that your patients are too hot, that they're peripherally vasodilated. Or sometimes people get embarrassed and they can, they can flush, particularly in the face and the neck. But it can also be a sign of allergic reactions. So if there's a systemic, overall severe allergic reaction, you can get reddening all over the body. You can get kind of a red man syndrome or a red neck or a red chest because of the flushing caused by the vasodilation as a result of the allergic response. Or sometimes the allergic response could be more localised where you get a, a rash on the area of exposure to the allergen, that is to whatever caused the allergic reaction. So systemic allergic reactions, flushing can be all over but you can get localised allergic reactions as well. And redness is also a feature of inflammation. As you know, the features of inflammation are heat, pain, redness, swelling, loss of function. So redness can be a sign of inflammation. So if we see redness caused by inflammation, we think, oh, what's caused that inflammation? Was it allergic? Was it an infection? Was it exposure to radiation? Was it a burn? What was it that caused that inflammatory reaction. And also, flushing can be caused by so-called distributive types of shock. So as we've said, with an allergic anaphylactic type reaction, you can get flushing and vasodilation. But you can also get that with neurogenic type shocks. And you can also get that with septic type shocks as well, where the vasodilation is part of the reason that the blood pressure is dropping. So if it's a septic shock, or a uh, anaphylactic shock or a neurogenic shock, the vasodilation is actually part of the problem that leads to the 
hypotensive response. And of course, another absolutely essential clinical observation in terms of skin colour is cyanosis. Now, cyanosis is the bluish tint that we can observe in the skin when the blood in the tissue becomes deoxygenated, when the haemoglobin becomes reduced. And normally we'll see cyanosis when the oxygen saturations drop below about 86%. So actually, if you're in clinical practice and you are observing cyanosis, that actually means your patient is already hypoxemic. In a sense, we've already failed. We should have hopefully corrected the hypoxemia before that stage. But when we notice cyanosis, we must think, oh dear, the oxygen saturations are 86% or less, time to get them back up again. And we have to reverse whatever is causing that hypoxemia. So that's a fairly good rule of thumb. Cyanosis means the saturations are about 86% or less. But we can divide cyanosis into central cyanosis and peripheral cyanosis. Now clinically, if we see central cyanosis, that's in the lips, the tongue, the neck, the centre of the chest, that is caused by hypoxemia. That's quite a serious clinical feature. So if someone's brought in with an acute asthmatic attack, for example, we might see central cyanosis. But in other times, we might see cyanosis on the, uh, in the ears or the fingertips or even the tips of the nose. And in this case, if it's peripheral cyanosis, it's probably caused by the fact that the blood is circulating slowly for some reason through the peripheral tissues. And if the red cells are circulating slowly through the peripheral tissues, this means they have plenty of time to give up their oxygen and they become more reduced than normal. That's going to increase the concentrations of deoxyhemoglobin in the red cells. But why do we see it as a blue colour? Well, you know that oxyhemoglobin, as you will get in systemic arteries, is bright red. And deoxyhemoglobin, as for example when we take a sample of venous blood, is dark red. So what's actually happening in cyanosis is that the blood is becoming dark red because the blood is becoming deoxygenated. But we're not actually seeing that blood itself. If we saw the blood itself, we would see dark red blood, as we sometimes see as a result of venous bleeding in a wound. We will see dark red blood. But in cyanosis, we're actually seeing the dark red colour either through the patient's lips or their tongue or through the patient's skin. And the combination of the dark red colour going through the skin or through the lips causes the human eye to perceive it as a blue colour. So actually when we see blue cyanosis, what it means is there is dark red blood in there, dark red deoxygenated blood. Now another abnormal colour that everyone knows about is jaundice. Jaundice is the yellow colouring. Very often you see it first in the sclera, in the white part of the eye, and then when it becomes more pronounced, you see it through the surface of the skin as well. And jaundice is caused by an accumulation of the bile pigment bilirubin in the blood. Bilirubin is a breakdown product of haemoglobin. Normally it's processed through the liver, excreted into the bile ducts where it goes into the duodenum through the sphincter of Oddi. But in the case of jaundice, the bile's not being excreted. Now this can be for a prehepatic reason, such as increased breakdown of red cells, so-called hemolytic jaundice, or it can be caused by reduced function of the liver cells, as you might get in viral hepatitis, or it can be caused by obstruction of the bile ducts, as you might get with gallstones or carcinoma of the head of the pancreas. So if we see jaundice, we need to think, oh, what's causing that jaundice? And the last one I think I'll mention is albinos. Now albinism is completely genetic. If you haven't got it now, you're not going to catch it, it's genetic. And it means that there is no pigment produced by the melanocytes. So these patients often have reddish coloured eyes, very pale coloured skin. Even black people can have white skin if they're albinos and often very light coloured hair as well and they're very photo photosensitive, 
so need to be careful to avoid sunburn. So there's just a few examples, but every patient you look at, you should be aware of the colour of their skin and learn about the clinical implications that alterations in skin colour and lip and mucous membrane colour has, part of good clinical observation skills.